Okay. Welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Jackie Jacob and I am one of two extension poultry specialists at the University of Kentucky. As part of my uh, job re um, responsibilities, I manage the small and backyard flocks community of practice on e-extension, which is the electronic version of the um, United States Cooperative Extension Service. Um, we deal specifically with small and backyard flocks. And as part of that, we um, have monthly uh, webinars on a variety of different topics. All our webinars are free of charge. They are all recorded and uh, available for later viewing. So you can view all past webinars and I will later put in a link for the upcoming webinars as well as for the past webinars. So you could always watch something um, from the, that we've done previously. If you see a topic that you, uh, there is no webinar planned or recorded for, let me know and I will try to uh, add that to our schedule. Uh, our speaker for today is Dr. Claudia Dunkley from the University of Georgia. She uh, originally from Jamaica, so I'm sure you'll notice the, the accent. Um, she is an extension specialist at the University of Georgia uh, with poultry. She's currently um, working with the FFA contest in their state, so no camera, but you will be able to see her presentation. Um, during the presentation, if you have a question, feel free to either type it in the chat box or in the Q&A box. I will be monitoring both. And if the question is a clarification of something that she's talking about at the time, I will pop up and uh, interrupt her. Otherwise, I'll be on mute. Um, but otherwise, uh, the questions will wait uh, until the end. There will be a period for um, Q&A. Um, so it's all yours, Claudia, if you wanna share your PowerPoint again. Okay. And don't forget to turn your sound on. Yeah. I think it's on. Are you hearing me? I'm hearing you, yes. Okay. I have two here, which one? Okay, that one. Okay, I'm going to go on mute and let you take over. All right, thank you, Jackie, for that introduction. And to everyone who has logged on so far, welcome. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you about small flock best management practices for egg preparation for sale, right? Um, trying to advance. Okay, there we go. So I'll just briefly address um, the types of small flock where you have egg production in their system. I'll talk a little bit about preparing the house for, for production. Then we'll go on to talking about collection of eggs, cleaning of eggs, grading of, of eggs, and we look at some egg oddities. So when it comes to types of small layer flock production systems, there are basically three types. So we have the cage systems that um, girls will have from say a thousand up to even 10,000 birds in cages. And these birds are housed about four to five birds in each cage, depending on the size of the cage. And then there, there are the free range systems, which include the pasture systems and the track, the ones, you know, all of those. And here you have up to a thousand layers in about a quarter acre enclosure at max. And we have our small Avery type systems where you have up to 50 birds in an enclosure. Now, each of these systems are different and pr certain practices are different in how they raise their birds. But at the end of the day, when it comes to 
preparing the eggs for sale, it pretty much comes down to the same thing. So preparing eggs for sale actually begins before the first egg is laid, right? Because if your pullets develop poor laying habits, this will follow them throughout their production life, right? It's very difficult to break them out of poor laying practices. So you want to ensure that the house is fully equipped with nest boxes and nesting materials if it's not a, a cage system. And these have to be in place before the birds or the pullets actually start displaying their nesting behavior. Now, what do you do? For the cage system, you want to make sure that those cages are slanted, right? So that the eggs can roll forward and out of the cage. And then of course, the, the collectors are gonna be picking up those eggs when they roll forward. Um, for the free range and every type um, systems, you want to ensure that these houses are equipped with the necessary equipment for egg production. So what do you need for, for these um, egg production? You need nest boxes, somewhere for these birds to lay, right? So you would want say four or five hens per nest box. And in these nest boxes, you should have good nesting material. And we'll talk a little bit more about nesting material as we go along. A perch at the entrance of the nest box is, is good. That's good for their um, well-being and for their welfare. It's a good practice for them. It's, it's something that they would have if they were in the wild, right? So it's good for the birds' well, welfare. Now, growers can be very inventive when it comes to nest boxes, right? You'll see them come up with a whole lot of different types of, of items that they turn into nest boxes. So, you know, you can use buckets. And um, in that corner here, you see somebody used an old TV. This is not ideal, but it can be used. And of course, you can go and purchase the, the commercially available nest boxes. What's important, you need to have those nest boxes a bit elevated, right? So about two feet above the ground, that would be good. And you want to add a perch where the birds can, can perch on before they actually enter into those nest boxes. <clears throat> so let us talk about nesting material. A good nesting material should be placed into each of these nest boxes. And the material that you use should be absorptive because you want to absorb any moisture that may be in the, um, the nest boxes, whether it's from droppings and to help to keep the eggs clean, right? So it's, it should be absorptive and it should be non-toxic. And here I have some examples of some nesting materials. So you can use your pine shavings, you can use um, peat moss, rice hull, chopped corn cobs, straw. You can go and purchase the commercially available Excelsior nest pad, or you can even use shredded paper, right? You want to clean out these nest boxes every now and then at least once a week and replace it with fresh material, right? Because the idea of, of um, this is to keep the eggs as clean as possible. So again, you want to ensure that the houses are equipped with the nest boxes with adequate nesting materials. You train your, your pullets. Sometimes you have different age birds. So the older, the, the pullets will watch what the older birds are doing and they will imitate them, right? Now, if you have all birds that are all the same age, um, layers are going, laying hens are, are going to have, um, nesting behavior, things that they will do when they are about to lay, right? So they'll start looking for somewhere that's soft, somewhere that's private, 
so that they can lay. So that's why it's important for you to have those nest boxes in place before they start displaying these nesting behavior. Otherwise, they're gonna lay in the bushes in the yard. They lay behind, um, if you have like drums or something inside the house, they lay behind them. And it's very difficult for you to break them out of, of um, these bad behaviors when they start doing that. They lay on the floor if they don't have a, a comfortable place to lay the egg, and it's difficult to break them out of laying eggs on the floor. So make sure that your equipment is in the houses before they actually begin to lay. The first egg that these pullets will lay, they are very small, usually small, and we call them peewee eggs. Now, if you are gonna um, raise birds to produce hatching eggs, and you incubate and um, you actually incubate eggs and hatch them, you don't incubate peewee eggs, right? You won't get tiny chicks if you incubate um, peewee eggs. So we don't do that. You pick up the peewee eggs and um, they can be eaten, but we don't sell those either. <clears throat> so depending on the breed, um, Pullets will begin laying as early as 20 weeks old, right? So it depends on the breed. Some breeds are early, some are later. Now, the smaller the bird is, the smaller the egg will be, right? So if it's a, a breed that produce average size eggs, you can, you can um, prevent her from starting too early, but that's another presentation. That's a whole other presentation, but you can actually delay them from beginning to, to start laying and um, extend it for a period where the bird is bigger, so you can start getting bigger eggs. Um, typically, they're going to start exhibiting nesting behaviors before they actually begin to lay, right? So they look for somewhere to nest before they actually begin to lay. Um, they, they'll start shuffling around, whether it's a, a um, movable material. If you, if you don't have the nest boxes ready and you have a littered floor, they'll make a little um, shallow hole in that area and sit there. So that, those are some of the nesting behavior that they will display. Eggs are typically laid early in the morning, but you should also check in the, in the afternoon and evening hours for those layers that are late layers. Then we have, um, when they start laying, birds will try to brood these eggs. And we say we brood, they brood a clutch of eggs. Each bird has a, a predestined clutch that they will lay, right? They don't all lay a dozen eggs and then they start to brood them. Different birds have different clutches that's ingrained in them. Now, you, if you are selling eggs, you don't want them to brood these eggs, right? Because they'll, um, they, the quality of the egg will deteriorate if they sit on, on that egg. And that's why it's important for you to pick up eggs, right? Don't leave them to, to gather. As you can see in this top picture, you have over a dozen eggs in this container. And if you look right here, you see that there's droppings on the egg eggs, right? It's not one bird that lay all of this. And the bird, the bird that is broody, um, she doesn't know it's not all her eggs, but that's her number. So she'll sit on it and try to brood them, right? So whether the eggs are fertile or not, hens can become broody because they are laying eggs to, to reproduce, right? To produce new chicks, not to give us something to eat. So they'll sit on it and brood. So you want to discourage this practice because a broody hen will stop laying and become aggressive, right? She has her number that she needs to, that's, that makes of her clutch. So she stopped laying and her goal now is to hatch these eggs so they can become aggressive. So you can um, discourage broody hens by building what we call a broody pen. And what this is, is a pen that doesn't have a littered floor. You put pebbles on the floor instead, it's not comfortable for them. So it can help to break them out of this practice. 
And again, brooding eggs will downgrade the egg quality. So with that, we'll talk about egg quality. What is egg quality? Now, egg quality includes the cleanliness of the shell, the soundness of the shell, right? You don't want cracks, the thickness of the albumin, and the color of the yolk. Of course, those you can see from on the outside. Now, if you will be hatching eggs, it's important to maintain the hatching potential of the eggs. So you don't want the eggs to be cracked because if it's cracked, you can't set those eggs. Improper handling or storage will reduce the egg quality and um, it will reduce the ability of those eggs to hatch to produce a quality chick. Um, eggs that are broken as a result of in can be broken as a result of inappropriate nesting material. That's why it's important that the nesting material be something soft that the eggs can just drop on because of course we don't want the eggs to crack. And again, if you leave the eggs in the too many eggs inside of a nest, when another bird comes and lays, you can have breakage to also. All right, so egg product, egg, egg collection is important. So whether or not the eggs are gonna be hatched or eaten, they should be collected frequently. For the best hatchability, hatching eggs need to be collected at least four times per day. You don't want to leave them in there overnight because they, the hens will start incubating them. The longer the egg stays in the nest, the nest, the more likely they'll become broken or soiled. Right? As you see from the bottom picture there, the eggs become soiled. If you leave them there for an extended time, some pre-incubation can occur, and this can reduce the, the hatch rate and the chick quality. Right? Even though we have a practice now where we pre-incubate eggs, put them back in the cooler, pre-incubate them again before we actually set them in the incubator, but that's a whole different class. Um, Table eggs, right? The eggs that we eat, the infertile eggs, they can also be downgraded if they are staying in the nest for an extended period and birds are sitting on them. So of course, eggs that are laid late in the day, you need to collect them and they should not be left to be collected the next day. So now we're gonna talk about grading eggs for markets. So eggs that are gonna be sold should be graded for internal and external qualities. So for internal qualities, eggs should be candled and they are graded double A, A, B, or loss eggs. And for external qualities, they are graded as double A or A, B, dirty, or loss. All right? So dirty and cracked eggs are loss eggs. And eggs that are leaking and moldy are also loss eggs. And it so happened, as Dr. Jacobs says, today we have poultry judging here in North Georgia. So these are some of the things that the students will be judging for this afternoon. And I'm going to tell you more about that. Now, in the state of Georgia, um, eggs should be candled or graded for the market by a licensed candler. So you will need to check with your state's Department of Ag to see if you need an egg graders certificate to, in order to, to sell eggs, right? So that's the first step you need to make. Find out if you need to be certified in order to sell eggs. And it's a written and candling examination that must be passed in order for you to be certified. So these are the internal grades of, of the egg. It's the, the quality factor or what you'll be looking at is the air cell, the albumin or the white of the egg, the yolk, and you're looking to see if there are blood or meat spots in those eggs. And these are the grades again, double A, A, B, and loss. 
Now, eggs that are just laid, those are typically, typically double A grade eggs. So in the supermarket, when you, you pick up a carton of eggs and you look at it, it says A grade eggs, but they leave the, the farm as double A grade eggs. By the time it gets to the consumer, it, it's an A grade. It, it has downgraded to A. So what are you looking for? So when you look at the air cell of a double A grade egg, it should be at least an eighth of an inch or less in diameter. The albumin or the white is usually clear and firm. The yolk, you, slide, you, you, you see a slight outline of that yolk and there is no blood or meat spot in that egg. For the A-grade egg, that air cell is gonna be about 3 16 of an inch or less, but it will be more than 1 8 of an inch in depth. Again, the albumin and white, it's clear and reasonably firm, while the yolk outline may be fairly well defined. There should be no blood or meat spot in an A-grade egg. For a B-grade egg, that air cell is going to be about 3 16 of an inch or more in depth. The albumin and white or the white, it should be clear and it may be weak and watery. The yolk should be clear, but it also can be weak and watery. There can be a blood or meat spot, but it should not, these should not total more than one eighth of an inch in diameter. A lost egg, what determines an egg as a lost egg is when it has blood or meat spot that's more than an eighth of an inch in diameter. So here we have a picture of looking, um, this picture down here, you see somebody is candling, right? So this is what you're judging. And there are, um, egg graders, uh, stencil that you can get from, from the Department of Ag too, right? So it, it shows you how much each section is and it helps you to, to develop, develop that ability to, to easily test, see what a, an, um, grade an egg is without even using the stencil, right? Again, the interior quality of the egg is determined by candling and candling is used in a light in a darkened room to see the inside of an egg. Depending on the size of your operation, you can use one of these candlers. This is what we'll use today at this um, competition. We are using this. There's this little hole right here where the light comes through. The candler holds it at a tilted, angle and they can see that ear cell at the top then they twirl that egg to see the, to see if the yolk moves to see if there's anything attached to the yolk usually if it has a blood spot it's attached to the yolk and it can be seen now if you have a larger operation you can get um some of the automated candle candle candling and washing machines right for example in this operation they have a small kit, they have a, a, a mid-range um, facility and they have this small candler washer and it weighs the egg, does all of that, right? So this is a candling section that you can see through the egg and, they, and the machine will select the ones that are not, um, that might have a blood spot. Of course, these are, eggs that are picked up the same day, so they know already that they would be double A or A grade eggs. Examples here of candled eggs. So here is the air cell of a double A grade egg. That's what it would look like. You can see the slight definition of the yolk down here. Over here, that's an A grade egg. Again, you can see the definition of the yolk. Down here, we have the B grade egg. The yolk is clearly defined right here. And this is also a B grade egg. It's an A based on the air cell, but because it has that blood or meat spot, it is 
termed as a B grade A because it's not bigger than one eighth of an inch. Okay. So we're gonna move on to cleaning these eggs. So if you're hatching eggs and the hatching eggs are dirty, you want to remove any debris or dirt using a cloth. You never use a wet towel or sandpaper, right? Wet towel spreads microbes around that egg, on that egg, and the, the, the shell of the egg is por porous, so they can actually go inside, right? So you never want to use a wet towel or sandpaper. Sandpaper is going to remove that protective cuticle. That's the last part that goes onto that eggshell in the development of, of an egg, right? A cuticle goes on and it helps to keep some of the microbes out. So you don't want to use sandpaper to get any um, adhering material off. Never set dirty eggs because bacteria will eventually penetrate that eggs from the dirt and that can result in the embryo dying in that shell and even exploding in the, the egg explodes in the incubator. And believe me, it's not a nice thing to have to clean up. So don't set dirty eggs. Um, when it comes to hatching eggs, of course, it's important to, to um, store them properly so that they, they can develop when it's time to put them in the incubator. So they need to cool, to be cooled to a temperature that's below the embryonic, so the threshold for embryonic development. So placing them in a refrigerator that's 55 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit will maintain them. And they can, they can, um, be maintained at that temperature for about a week without reducing the hatchability of the eggs. Now, the longer you keep them, then they'll start, you start get a lower hatching percentage from your, from your batch, right? So you don't want to store them for too long before you sell them or incubate them. Now, cleaning of table eggs is different. The first thing you're gonna do is re, re, um, separate your clean eggs from your dirty and cracked eggs. Cracked eggs should not be sold and leaking eggs should not be consumed by humans. Dirty eggs should be washed. Yes, you can wash them, but you have to use water that is warmer than the temperature of the egg, right? It is better and safer not to wash the eggs at all than to wash them in water that's cooler than the egg. Right, um, egg washing sanitizers can be used, but the eggs should not be allowed to stand or soak in water. Right, we don't want that because it, the water will get inside of the eggs. Eggs can be rinsed to remove any residue of sanitizers, and you want to quickly dry them before you pack them. Eggs again can be wiped off with a dry, clean cloth or paper towel, right? So you don't have to wash it if it's not dirty. If it's something that you can wipe off, wipe it off. Now, washing table eggs is divided into three phases. So you have the pre-washing phase or you wet it, you wet the egg, can, um, it can be a gentle spray of warm water. Remember the water should be cooler than the egg. Then you have the washing phase. And in the washing phase, this involves rubbing off the eggs with maybe brushes if it's the automated system. And if, it's, if, if you're not using an automated system, you can use a brush to, to brush them off. And um, of course you can use a clean cloth also. Then after the washing phase, then you have the rinsing phase. And the rinsing phase is done to remove any loose debris or residues of chemical or other dissolved material of the eggs, right? So here we have that, that um, automated one. It has a brush system in it. It has the rinsing and it goes through that system. Here you have a, one that is smaller, that um, a smaller producer may use this will dunk the, the um, eggs and it elevates it that it's not sitting in that water.
Then we have the post-washing phase, and this involves drying the eggs. You want to dry them promptly and thoroughly after they are washed. And you do this to avoid the growth of mold, and you don't want the bacteria to to penetrate that cell. Because you have washed it, you've gotten rid of the cuticle basically. So we don't want bacterial penetration of those eggs. So you want to use a clean dry cloth or you can use um, paper towels um, in that non-automated system. Some of the automated systems, they have um, fans that blow through that helps to, to dry these eggs. Then the second, post washing phase is the oiling phase. And this is optional, you don't have to do this, but you can use mineral oils to um, wipe the eggs with. It helps to seal the shell pores that are now open because you've gotten rid of the cuticle and it can help to maintain the integrity of the internal part of the eggs. And lastly, you cool those eggs down, right? So you you can store them in a refrigerator at about 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Packaging, of course, that's important if you're gonna sell your eggs. If you're selling them in cartons, the date that you pack them and an expiration date should also be shown. Um, the grade of an egg should be indicated on your packaging and it should be attached at the time of grading and packaging. And this information is given to you whenever you do that, um, that candling or grading certification. It's important that whenever you're packaging raw shelled eggs, that's not treated to destroy salmonella, it should always carry that safe handling instruction statement, right? So on your packaging, when you put your, the name of your farm and the grade of your egg, you should always have this. And this instruction simply says, safe handling instructions to prevent illness from bacteria, keep eggs refrigerated, cook eggs until yolks are firm, and cook foods containing eggs thoroughly, right? So that is that, that information, of course, you'll get whenever you do that candling class. And storing, storing off table eggs. Eggs should be refrigerated soon after they are collected and cleaned. They should be stored at temperatures at 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And that will maintain those egg for extended periods of time. Remember that heat, heat will break down the protein structure of the egg and it will also cause it to lose moisture, right? So it will downgrade the egg from say a double A to an A grade, even down to a B grade if you leave them in heated areas, right? Um, you can store in a, in a home refrigerator because the refrigerator section is usually about 55 degrees. It's, it will help to slow down that process. And if you store them at the proper temperature, you can have these eggs for a long time without losing any significant, um, without having any significant loss of quality. All right, so I'm gonna finish up just showing you some external qualities of eggs. We lost that you, can Claudia. Make an egg unsaleable. We, we spoke a lot. You were breaking up. Hello? Yeah, we lost, we lost you for okay. a minute there. If you want to start All this right. slide over again. again. Okay, we'll do. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, because something just came up telling me that my internet was unstable. Ah. Yeah, we you broke up when you started the current slide that you're on. So if all you right, start right. with this one again, you'll be fine. Okay, so yes, so we're going to now talk about some internal qualities of eggs that can make your, your eggs unsaleable. 
And this first one here is a shellless egg. And this is where you find the egg, the internal parts of the egg is only protected by the shell membranes. Typically, you'll find this with birds that has an immature shell gland. So the younger birds, you might find it here, or it can be as a result of diseases such as AI, um, infectious bronchitis, Newcastle disease, and egg drop syn syndrome. Then we have the thin shelled eggs. Now this is different from the shellless eggs. Here we have only a thin layer of calcium is added to that shell membrane. And you'll find this in older birds. Sometimes it's too much phosphorus that's in their diet. It can, can be stress, heat stress, salty water, or mycotoxins. Then we have the slab-sided eggs. And this occur when one egg is already in that shell gland and then a second one enters the shell gland. So the second one that comes in, it, it presses against the one that's there and it's flattened. And if you can see that flattened area here, that's what that slab side um, looks like. And changes in lighting, disease and stress can, can result with this, that one egg coming down too early before the other one is out. Cracked eggs, it's difficult to see here, but if you look closely in this area, you'll see those large cracked cracks. Sometimes they are star or hairline cracks, and sometimes they result in um, a hole, a small hole will um, appear in that shell. As a bird gets older, you'll see more of this. Sometimes it's heat stress or calcium or vitamin D deficiency. Even mycotoxins can cause this. Then we have our body check eggs. If you look within the circle here, you see those, that crack there. So what happened? The egg cracked when it was in the uterus and then it's mended again because you see that band that goes around it. So it is mended again and um, before it is laid. You find this mostly in older birds. Sometimes incorrect lighting in the houses causes this stress, or if you have too many birds in, in your pen, sometimes that, that stresses them out and it causes that. Calcium deposits, I'm sure you've seen some of these. These are irregularly shaped calcium on the surface of the shell. And typically it is a result of um, defective shell gland. Sometimes you have disturbances during calcification or excess calcium in the diet that causes this. White or brown um, speckled eggs. This is still, this is a calcium deposition issue also. It's, it occurs on the shell before or after the shell is fully formed. And you find this mainly in the younger birds or it can be a defective shell gland disturbances during calcification or excess calcium in, in the diet. Then we have this type of discoloration also. This is from a bird that lays a, a light brown egg, but sometimes you find um, they are unevenly colored or the color is not consistent with the, the breed egg color range, right? And this occur when you have defective um, shell gland or disturbances during calcification. So these birds are, are quite finicky, right? We don't want to disturb them during the process where the egg shell is being laid down. You'll find a lot of these different issues. This one is um, pimpled eggs and you, it's another calcium deposition issue. Right, so if you look on the shell, you can see those little spots. This, these eggs feel rough. It's like a, a um, it's like a, what's the name of that paper again? Sandpaper, right? These are small lumps of calcium on the shell and the severity of it depends on the amount of foreign material that's present during calcification. It, you find this more in older birds if their nutrition is not enough and some strain of birds happen to 
experiences more. Then we have our wrinkled eggs. Here you have these wrinkled, thinly creased and wrinkled surfaces, and it occurs through stress. Of course, overcrowding causes stress, um, infectious bronchitis, or a defective shell gland causes that. These are what we call corrugated eggs. You have very rough surfaces, and it happens when the plumping, and plumping is when water is, is, is um, placed inside of the shell membranes to give the egg that sh egg shape, right? And it gets that before the shell, the, the, the calcium starts going on to make the shell. So if, if, if the plumping was not done properly, then you will find this, this issue. Sometimes if the water is too salty, you'll find it more often in birds. If as the birds get older, you'll see it. <clears throat> You're more likely to see it in an older bird than a younger bird. Poor nutrition also causes this. Then we have our misshaped eggs. And these are basically odd shaped eggs. Sometimes it might be too round, too long. Then you have these odd shape, right? Typically, you find this in an immature shell gland. That means it's a younger bird that will have that you'll see doing this. <clears throat> Disease can cause this. Stress and overcrowding also causes this. Then we have our dirty eggs, and these are eggs that are usually stained by feces <clears throat> because you have wet droppings, right? And this, this can be because you have a large amount of indigestible compounds in the feed, so it's a nutritional thing. Or sometimes it can be just poor gut health or salty water. And then we have our blood-stained eggs, usually seen in younger birds early in lay. So when, when the birds are young and they just begin to lay, sometimes you see this. Um, <clears throat> they are straining to lay and they have, as a result, you have prolapsed, a prolapsed cloaca. And then you have ventekin or cannibalism, right? Because that the cloaca looks pink because the birds are straining. You have cannibalism. And of course, when they start laying, the eggs get bloodstained. And you typically will see this when the pullets are just coming in to lay or if they are too fat, right? If they are overweight. Or if there's a sudden increase in day length or too, too much bright light, right? Of course, the birds, because of the bright light, they are seeing, they, they get very irritable. They are seeing the cloaca, they are sticking out and they start, the cannibalism can start. Okay, so I think that is the last slide. And I am available for a few questions, if there are any. We have one question that I didn't deal with. How hereditary are defective shell glands? How hereditary? Yeah, how, what, what's the genetics? Is it, is it a genetic thing for shell glands, defective shell glands, or is it just nutrition, management, it, age? It, yes, it's, it's management. A lot of it is management. And um, there are some breeds that it's more prevalent in, but how hereditary it is, I cannot, I cannot say, but there are some breeds that it's more prevalent in them. Right. Okay. Uh, there was a, a need for clarification on the washing of the eggs. Um, mm -hmm. I answered most of them. It okay. was uh, the fact that the water that you use to wash needs to be hotter than the, the egg. egg. Mm -hmm. Otherwise the contents contract and you suck in the bacteria yeah. and, yeah. and water into the egg and cause a food safety issue. Yeah. There was some confusion on that. There is also a confusion on the storage temperature for eggs. Um, for example, in Washington, they have to be held at 41 degrees or lower. Oh. Um, Kentucky is 45 degrees or lower. That's by state law. Mm -hmm. So make sure you check with your state yes, department yes, of right. ag for what oh. their 
mm -hmm. you're selling eggs. You may also need an egg handler's license depending on how many eggs you are selling. So make sure you always check with your right. uh, department eggs before, before you um, and, start and selling eggs. And this information eggs. will be given if you have to do that, that um, class. Right. Yeah, most, I don't know that many states that require you to do the class, but there are ones that do. So oh, okay. it is important that they oh, verify Georgia that. Is one. Georgia is one. You have to do that if you're selling. Yeah, Kentucky doesn't require it. Oh. Um, those were the questions. Does, um, I guess my question, oh, there's one open. Appreciate the, will the recording be available? Yes, the re, all of them are re available. Recording will go up on YouTube and Facebook later today. Um, let's see, questions coming in. Uh, Florida does not require the certification either. Okay, um, you, but it's good to know how to candle them to, to know what you're selling. Yes, but you don't necessarily have to candle the eggs. There's a question here. I have 25 birds and hope to sell the eggs. Do I need an egg candler license in Kentucky? Kentucky, no, you do not, uh, nor do you need an egg handler's license unless you sell at least 60 dozen eggs in any one week. Um, but you have to have all the clean, you cannot reuse egg cartons. You must have the safe handling instructions. You have to have the name of the um, farm and the contact um, address on there um, for back trace back if there's a problem with it um, and a number of other things. Uh, if you email me and I'll put my email in here since you're a Kentucky person and that's where I am, I can send you to the right person for that. Um, where will the YouTube link for this webinar be posted? Uh, you will be able to find it on the same place where you registered so that the past webinar link that has it will have the YouTube link there. If you're on our Facebook page, it will also get posted on the, um, the Facebook page. Um, and I, I will probably email it out to everybody that registered. So uh, you'll get that. Um, do all eggs need to be washed, even if they look perfectly clean? That's a state no. a state thing too. Mm -hmm. Some states require it. Um, obviously Georgia doesn't, right? No. I don't believe Kentucky does. The, Kentucky doesn't require that you candle the eggs, but if you don't candle, you have to say uncandled eggs. Oh. Um, Although if you are selling eggs, I recommend candling them because if your customers get blood uh, in their egg, right. they may not come back for more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so getting them out is always a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, North Carolina State University um, indicated that unwashed, clean unwashed eggs had a high level of bacteria on the outside, washing it, put it down to next to nothing. And if you had dirty eggs that you washed, you basically take it down to the level of bacteria on an unwashed clean egg. So North Carolina recommends washing, Kentucky mm -hmm. recommends washing, but doesn't require it. Um, you're better off not require not washing if you don't do it right mm -hmm. it's more of a thing for that so um any other questions uh, answering some of these uh, on the thing uh Maybe we'll be available. Okay. Florida has a small poultry egg handler's license requirement. Okay, that's good to know. Everybody's different. Um, and again, lots of everything is very state depend, you know, 
state dependent. So always check with your Department of Ag. If anybody um, gets sick from your eggs, you could be sued. So yeah. liability insurance is always a good idea because um, if you're trying to just make a little income, little extra income and um, they uh, you get sick from it, you know, they can sue you. So <laughs> you could lose everything because you tried to make a little extra income. So check with your farm policy to see about um, trying to um, have liability insurance. Um, I don't think Ohio has egg candling or washing requirements for small flocks. It may often depend on the number of eggs that you sell. Um, so make sure you check uh, with your with the Department of Ag. Uh, Department of Ag. Somebody asked about the candling card. Um, you should be able to get them from USDA. Sometimes they even send like to send out um, hundreds of them. So <laughs> that's, that's true. Yeah. When I order them, I get a hundred at a time. So um, they're called uh, air cell gauge, I think. Uh, yes, air, yes. air grading gauge or something like that. I have one in my back pocket somewhere, Jackie. Yeah, you must have because you, <laughs> you're getting ready for the contest there. Yeah. I've had one, but I don't. I don't see. If you look on the USDA site, I'm sure they have a link to it. Along with other things. Official egg air cell gauge. USDA air cell Oops. gauge. Any other questions we haven't answered yet? I think next week's will be really interesting. We are uh, we have an engineer coming on to talk about uh, modifying existing structures for poultry housing. So that should be interesting. Um, as I said, there, there I put in the links to um, our uh, upcoming webinars. Uh, I'll do that again. Um, and the recordings from the past webinars, if there was something that you might be interested in. And um, always check out our Facebook page because um, I post uh, a lot of things there as well. So um, yeah. any other questions? I, don't, I guess the big question that I'm surprised nobody asked is that um, if you're washing eggs for 25 hens, that's not too bad to hand wash that many eggs. Yes. But um, if you are um, washing for 3,000 hens, there are automated... Um, machines that you can purchase. Unfortunately for the small ones, they can be expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to, you know, look at that carefully to see. Um, they often do automatic washing. Um, you can get it to weigh them if you want. You don't have to weigh the eggs yeah. um, for small flocks. Um, they have candling lights that you can use to candle the eggs quickly. Um, and then you can grab them and put them in packaging. It's much faster that way. There are, they come in a variety of different sizes that might work for 500 or 5,000 birds um, and not the 50,000 um, ones that we did that, you know, for large scale companies. Um, somebody wanted to know if we will be doing a webinar on incubation. Um, I think, I don't remember if we did one or not. Um, I can work on one. Um, 
it's part of our program. You can put that in. I think I have something like that for Kentucky, but not specifically for um, for the national one. But we'll we'll see if we can come up with something. Post it. Uh, thank you once again for an excellent session. Yes, Claudia, you did a great job. They liked looking at your irregular eggs. Um, yeah, you get a lot of different strange eggs. I've seen yeah. some pretty weird ones myself. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay, yeah. so that I don't see any more questions. Everybody oh. have a good day. I'm going to shut down the recording. All uh, right. Where's my recording page? Uh, gotta stop the recording. There we are. Stop the recording.